the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996 was enacted by the United States Congress and signed by President Bill Clinton in 1996. It has been known as the Kennedy Euro Kassebaum Act or Kassebaum Kennedy Act after two of its leading sponsors. Title I of HIPAA protects health insurance coverage for workers and their families when they change or lose their jobs. Title II of HIPAA, known as the Administrative Simplification Provisions, requires the establishment of national standards for electronic health care transactions and national identifiers for providers, health insurance plans, and employers. Title I, Healthcare Access, Portability, and Renewability Title I of HIPAA regulates the availability and breadth of group health plans and certain individual health insurance policies. It amended the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, the Public Health Service Act, and the Internal Revenue Code. Title I requires the coverage of and also limits restrictions that a group health plan can place on benefits for pre-existing conditions. Group health plans may refuse to provide benefits relating to pre-existing conditions for a period of 12 months after enrollment in the plan or 18 months in the case of late enrollment. Title I allows individuals to reduce the exclusion period by the amount of time that they had creditable coverage prior to enrolling in the plan and after any significant breaks in coverage. Creditable coverage is defined quite broadly and includes nearly all group and individual health plans, Medicare, and Medicaid. A significant break in coverage is defined as any 63-day period without any creditable coverage. Title I also requires insurers to issue policies without exclusion to those leaving group health plans with creditable coverage exceeding 18 months, and renew individual policies for as long as they are offered or provide alternatives to discontinued plans for as long as the insurer stays in the market without exclusion regardless of health condition. Some healthcare plans are exempted from Title I requirements, such as long-term health plans and limited-scope plans such as dental or vision plans that are offered separately from the general health plan. However, if such benefits are part of the general health plan, then HIPAA still applies to such benefits. For example, if the new plan offers dental benefits, then it must count creditable continuous coverage under the old health plan towards any of its exclusion periods for dental benefits. An alternate method of calculating creditable continuous coverage is available to the health plan under Title I. That is, five categories of health coverage can be considered separately, including dental and vision coverage. Anything not under those five categories must use the general calculation. Since limited coverage plans are exempt from HIPAA requirements, the odd case exists in which the applicant to a general group health plan cannot obtain certificates of creditable continuous coverage for independent limited scope plans such as dental to apply towards exclusion periods of the new plan that does include those coverages. Hidden exclusion periods are not valid under Title I. Such clauses must not be acted upon by the health plan and also must be rewritten so that they comply with HIPAA. To illustrate, suppose someone enrolls in a group health plan on January 1, 2006. This person had previously been insured from January 1, 2004 until February 1, 2005 and from August 1, 2005 until December 31, 2005. To determine how much coverage can be credited against the exclusion period in the new plan, start at the enrollment date and count backwards until a significant break in coverage is reached. So, the five months of coverage between August 1, 2005 and December 31, 2005 clearly counts against the exclusion period. But the period without insurance between February 1, 2005 and August 1, 2005 is greater than 63 days. Thus. This is a significant break in coverage, and any coverage prior to it cannot be deducted from the exclusion period. So, this person could deduct five months from his exclusion period, reducing the exclusion period to seven months. Hence, Title I requires that any pre-existing condition begin to be covered on August 1, 2006. Title II, Preventing Healthcare Fraud and Abuse Administrative Simplification Medical Liability Reform, Title II of HIPAA defines policies, 
procedures and guidelines for maintaining the privacy and security of individually identifiable health information as well as outlining numerous offenses relating to healthcare and set civil and criminal penalties for violations. It also creates several programs to control fraud and abuse within the healthcare system. However, the most significant provisions of Title II are its administrative simplification rules. Title II requires the Department of Health and Human Services to draft rules aimed at increasing the efficiency of the healthcare system by creating standards for the use and dissemination of healthcare information. These rules appellate to covered entities as defined by HIPAA and the HHS. Covered entities include health plans, healthcare clearinghouses, such as billing services and community health information systems, and healthcare providers that transmit healthcare data in a way that is regulated by HIPAA. Per the requirements of Title II, the HHS has promulgated five rules regarding administrative simplification the Privacy Rule, the Transactions and Code Sets Rule, the Security Rule, the Unique Identifiers Rule, and the Enforcement Rule. Privacy Rule the effective compliance date of the privacy rule was April 14, 2003 with a one-year extension for certain small plans. The HIPAA privacy rule regulates the use and disclosure of protected health information held by covered entities by regulation. The Department of Health and Human Services extended the HIPAA privacy rule to independent contractors of covered entities who fit within the definition of business associates. Fires any information held by a covered entity which concerns health status, provision of health care, or payment for health care that can be linked to an individual. This is interpreted rather broadly and includes any part of an individual's medical record or payment history. Covered entities must disclose FI to the individual within 30 days upon request. They also must disclose FI when required to do so by law such as reporting suspected child abuse to state child welfare agencies. Covered entities may disclose protected health information to law enforcement officials for law enforcement purposes as required by law and administrative requests. Or to identify or locate a suspect, fugitive, material witness, or missing person. A covered entity may disclose FI to facilitate treatment, payment or healthcare operations without a patient's express written authorization. Any other disclosures of FI require the covered entity to obtain written authorization from the individual for the disclosure. However, when a covered entity discloses any FI, it must make a reasonable effort to disclose only the minimum necessary information required to achieve its purpose. The privacy rule gives individuals the right to request that a covered entity correct any inaccurate FI. It also requires covered entities to take reasonable steps to ensure the confidentiality of communications with individuals. For example, an individual can ask to be called at his or her work number instead of home or cell phone numbers. The privacy rule requires covered entities to notify individuals of uses of their FI. Covered entities must also keep track of disclosures of FI and document privacy policies and procedures. They must appoint a privacy official and a contact person responsible for receiving complaints and train all members of their workforce in procedures regarding FI. An individual who believes that the privacy rule is not being upheld can file a complaint with the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights. However, according to the Wall Street Journal, the OCR has a long backlog and ignores most complaints. Complaints of privacy violations have been piling up at the Department of Health and Human Services. Between April of 2003 and November 2006, the agency fielded 23,886 complaints related to medical privacy rules, but has not yet taken any enforcement actions against hospitals, doctors, insurers or anyone else for rule violations. A spokesman for the agency says it has closed three-quarters of the complaints, typically because it found no violation or after it provided informal guidance to the parties involved. However, in July 2011, UCLA agreed to pay $865,500 in a settlement regarding potential HIPAA violations. An HHS Office for Civil Rights investigation showed that from 2005 to 2008 unauthorized employees repeatedly and without legitimate cause looked at the electronic protected health information of numerous UCLA's patients. 
2013 final omnibus rule update, in January 2013, HIPAA was updated via the final omnibus rule. Included in changes were updates to the security rule and breach notification portions of the HITEC Act. The greatest changes relate to the expansion of requirements to include business associates, where only covered entities had originally been held to uphold these sections of the law. Additionally, the definition of significant harm to an individual in the analysis of a breach was updated to provide more scrutiny to covered entities with the intent of disclosing more breaches which had been previously gone unreported. Previously an organization needed proof that harm had occurred whereas now they must prove the counter, that harm had not occurred. Protection of FI was changed from indefinite to 50 years after death. More severe penalties were also approved for violation of FI privacy. Unintended consequences One consequence of HIPAA is hospitals will not reveal any information on people that may have been admitted under emergency conditions or even if that person is a patient in the hospital. This makes it difficult or impossible to locate a person who might be missing. In the case of the Asiana Airlines Flight 214 San Francisco crash, Asiana was unable to locate many passengers after the accident. Injured passengers were sent to 13 different area hospitals, and there was no list prepared at the time to help the airline track passengers. Hospitals also were reluctant to release information to the airline due to privacy laws, the airline said. Transactions and Code Sets Rule HIPAA was intended to make the healthcare system in the United States more efficient by standardizing healthcare transactions. HIPAA added a new Part C titled Administrative Simplification to Title XI of the Social Security Act. This is supposed to simplify healthcare transactions by requiring all health plans to engage in healthcare transactions in a standardized way. The HIPA AEDI provision was scheduled to take effect from October 16, 2003 with a one-year extension for certain small plans. However, due to widespread confusion and difficulty in implementing the rule, CMS granted a one-year extension to all parties. On January 1, 2012 newer versions, ASCX 12005010 and NCPDPD0 become effective, Replacing the previous ASCX 12004010 and NCPDP 5.1 mandate. The ASCX 12005010 version provides a mechanism allowing the use of ICD 10 cm as well as other improvements. After July 1, 2005, most medical providers that file electronically did have to file their electronic claims using the HIPAA standards in order to be paid. Under HIPAA, HIPAA covered health plans are now required to use standardized HIPAA electronic transactions. C. 42 U.S.C. A section 1320d2 and 45 C.F. A part 162. Information about this can be found in the final rule for HIPAA electronic transaction standards, and on the CMS website here, CMS information on HIPAA standardized electronic transactions, key EDI. X12. Transactions used for HIPAA compliance are, EDI healthcare claim transaction set is used to submit healthcare claim billing information, encounter information, or both, except for retail pharmacy claims. It can be sent from providers of healthcare services to payers either directly or via intermediary billers and claims clearing houses. It can also be used to transmit healthcare claims and billing payment information between payers with different payment responsibilities where coordination of benefits is required or between payers and regulatory agencies to monitor the rendering, billing, and or payment of healthcare services within a specific healthcare insurance industry segment. For example, a state mental health agency may mandate all healthcare claims. Providers and health plans who trade professional healthcare claims electronically must use the 837 Healthcare Claim Professional Standard to send in claims. As there are many different business applications for the healthcare claim, there can be slight derivations to cover off claims involving unique claims such as for institutions, professionals, chiropractors, and dentists etc. 
EDI Retail Pharmacy Claim Transaction is used to submit retail pharmacy claims to payers by healthcare professionals who dispense medications either directly or via intermediary billers and claims clearinghouses. It can also be used to transmit claims for retail pharmacy services and billing payment information between payers with different payment responsibilities where coordination of benefits is required or between payers and regulatory agencies to monitor the rendering, billing, and or payment of retail pharmacy services within the pharmacy healthcare insurance industry segment. EDI Healthcare Claim Payment Advice Transaction Set can be used to make a payment, send an explanation of benefits, send an explanation of payments remittance advice, or make a payment and send an EOP remittance advice only from a health insurer to a healthcare provider either directly or via a financial institution. EDI Benefit Enrollment and Maintenance Set can be used by employers, unions, government agencies, associations or insurance agencies to enroll members to a payer. The payer is a healthcare organization that pays claims, administers insurance or benefit or product. Examples of payers include an insurance company, healthcare professional, preferred provider organization government agency or any organization that may be contracted by one of these former groups. EDI payroll deducted and other group premium payment for insurance products is a transaction set which can be used to make a premium payment for insurance products. It can be used to order a financial institution to make a payment to a payee. EDI healthcare eligibility benefit inquiry is used to inquire about the health care benefits and eligibility associated with a subscriber or dependent. EDI Healthcare Eligibility Benefit Response is used to respond to a request inquiry about the health care benefits and eligibility associated with a subscriber or dependent. EDI Healthcare Claim Status Request This transaction set can be used by a provider, recipient of healthcare products or services or their authorized agent to request the status of a healthcare claim. EDI Healthcare Claim Status Notification This transaction set can be used by a healthcare payer or authorized agent to notify a provider, recipient or authorized agent regarding the status of a healthcare claim or encounter, or to request additional information from the provider regarding a healthcare claim or encounter. This transaction set is not intended to replace the healthcare claim payment advice transaction set and therefore, is not used for account payment posting. The notification is at a summary or service line detail level. The notification may be solicited or unsolicited. EDI Healthcare Service Review Information This transaction set can be used to transmit healthcare service information, such as subscriber, patient, demographic, diagnosis or treatment data for the purpose of request for review, certification, notification or reporting the outcome of a healthcare services review. EDI Functional Acknowledgement Transaction Set This transaction set can be used to define the control structures for a set of acknowledgements to indicate the results of the syntactical analysis of the electronically encoded documents. Although it is not specifically named in the HIPAA legislation or final rule, it is necessary for X12 transaction set processing. The encoded documents are the transaction sets, which are grouped in functional groups used in defining transactions for business data interchange. This standard does not cover the semantic meaning of the information encoded in the transaction sets. Brief 5010 Transactions and Code Sets Rules Update Summary 1. Transaction Set will be replaced by Transaction Set Acknowledgement Report. 2. The size of many field segment elements will be expanded, causing a need for all IT providers to expand corresponding fields, element files, GUI, paper media and databases. 3. Some segments have been removed from existing transaction sets. 4. Many segments have been added to existing transaction sets allowing greater tracking and reporting of cost and patient encounters. 5. Capacity to use both international classification of diseases versions 9 and 10 has been added. Security rule. The final rule on security standards was issued on February 20, 2003. It took effect on April 21, 2003 with a compliance date of April 21, 2005 for most covered entities and April 21, 2006 for small plans. The security rule complements the privacy rule.
while the privacy rule pertains to all protected health information including paper and electronic, the security rule deals specifically with electronic protected health information. It lays out three types of security safeguards required for compliance, administrative, physical, and technical. For each of these types, the rule identifies various security standards, and for each standard, it names both required and addressable implementation specifications. Required specifications must be adopted and administered as dictated by the rule. Addressable specifications are more flexible. Individual covered entities can evaluate their own situation and determine the best way to implement addressable specifications. Some privacy advocates have argued that this flexibility may provide too much latitude to covered entities. The standards and specifications are as follows. Administrative safeguards are Euro policies and procedures designed to clearly show how the entity will comply with the Act. Covered entities must adopt a written set of privacy procedures and designate a privacy officer to be responsible for developing and implementing all required policies and procedures. The policies and procedures must reference management oversight and organizational buy into compliance with the documented security controls. Procedures should clearly identify employees or classes of employees who will have access to electronic protected health information. Access to EPHI must be restricted to only those employees who have a need for it to complete their job function. The procedures must address access authorization, establishment, modification, and termination. Entities must show that an appropriate ongoing training program regarding the handling of FIs provided to employees performing health plan administrative functions. Covered entities that outsource some of their business processes to a third party must ensure that their vendors also have a framework in place to comply with HIPAA requirements. Companies typically gain this assurance through clauses in the contract stating that the vendor will meet the same data protection requirements that apply to the covered entity. Care must be taken to determine if the vendor further outsources any data handling functions to other vendors and monitor whether appropriate contracts and controls are in place. A contingency plan should be in place for responding to emergencies. Covered entities are responsible for backing up their data and having disaster recovery procedures in place. The plan should document data priority and failure analysis, testing activities, and change control procedures. Internal audits play a key role in HIPAA compliance by reviewing operations with the goal of identifying potential security violations. Policies and procedures should specifically document the scope, frequency, and procedures of audits. Audits should be both routine and event-based. Procedures should document instructions for addressing and responding to security breaches that are identified either during the audit or the normal course of operations. Physical safeguards are Euro controlling physical access to protect against inappropriate access to protected data, controls must govern the introduction and removal of hardware and software from the network. Access to equipment containing health information should be carefully controlled and monitored. Access to hardware and software must be limited to properly authorized individuals. Required access controls consist of facility security plans, maintenance records and visitor sign-in and escorts. Policies are required to address proper workstation use. Workstations should be removed from high traffic areas and monitor screens should not be in direct view of the public. If the covered entities utilize contractors or agents, they too must be fully trained on their physical access responsibilities. Technical safeguards are Euro controlling access to computer systems and enabling covered entities to protect communications containing fire transmitted electronically over open networks from being intercepted by anyone other than the intended recipient. Information systems housing fire must be protected from intrusion. When information flows over open networks, some form of encryption must be utilized. If closed systems networks are utilized, Existing access controls are considered sufficient and encryption is optional. Each covered entity is responsible for ensuring that the data within its systems has not been changed or erased in an unauthorized manner. Data corroboration, including the use of checksum, double keying, message authentication, and digital signature may be used to ensure data integrity. 
covered entities must also authenticate entities with which they communicate. Authentication consists of corroborating that an entity is who it claims to be. Examples of corroboration include, password systems, two- or three-way handshakes, telephone callback, and token systems. Covered entities must make documentation of their HIPAA practices available to the government to determine compliance. In addition to policies and procedures and access records, information technology documentation should also include a written record of all configuration settings on the components of the network because these components are complex, configurable, and always changing. Documented risk analysis and risk management programs are required. Covered entities must carefully consider the risks of their operations as they implement systems to comply with the Act. Unique identifies rule. HIPAA covered entities such as providers completing electronic transactions, healthcare clearinghouses, and large health plans, must use only the national provider identifier to identify covered healthcare providers in standard transactions by May 23, 2007. Small health plans must use only the NPI by May 23, 2008. Effective from May 2006, all covered entities using electronic communications must use a single new NPI. The NPI replaces all other identifiers used by health plans, Medicare, Medicaid, and other government programs. However, the NPI does not replace a provider's DEA number, state license number, or tax identification number. The NPI is 10 digits, with the last digit being a checksum. The NPI cannot contain any embedded intelligence. In other words, the NPI is simply a number that does not itself have any additional meaning. The NPI is unique and national, never reused, and except for institutions, a provider usually can have only one. An institution may obtain multiple NPIs for different subparts such as a freestanding cancer center or rehab facility. Enforcement Rule on February 16, 2006, HHS issued the final rule regarding HIPAA enforcement. It became effective on March 16, 2006. The enforcement rule sets civil money penalties for violating HIPAA rules and establishes procedures for investigations and hearings for HIPAA violations. For many years there were few prosecutions for violations. This may have changed with the finning of $50,000 to the Hospice of North Idaho as the first entity to be fined for a potential HIPAA security rule breach affecting fewer than 500 people. Rachel Seeger, a spokeswoman for HHS, stated, A Euro Oihoni did not conduct an accurate and thorough risk analysis to the confidentiality of EFI as part of his security management process from 2005 through January 17, 2012 a Euro this investigation was initiated with the theft from an employee's vehicle of an unencrypted laptop containing 441 patient records. As of March 2013, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Resources has investigated over 19,306 cases that have been resolved by requiring changes in privacy practice or by corrective action. If non-compliance is determined by HHS, entities must apply corrective measures. Complaints have been investigated against many different types of businesses such as national pharmacy chains, major health care centers, insurance groups, hospital chains and other small providers. There were 9,146 cases where the HHS investigation found that HIPAA was followed correctly. There were 44,118 cases that HHS did not find eligible cause for enforcement. For example, a violation that started before HIPAA started. Cases withdrawn by the persona. Or an activity that does not actually violate the rules. According to the HHS website, the following lists the issues that have been reported according to frequency, misuse and disclosures of FI, no protection in place of health information, patient unable to access their health information, using or disclosing more than the minimum necessary protected health information, no safeguards of electronic protected health information. The most common entities found to be required to take corrective action in order to be in voluntary compliance according to HHS are listed by frequency private practices, hospitals, outpatient facilities, 
group plans such as insurance groups, pharmacies, HITECH Act, privacy requirements, see the privacy section of the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. Effects on research and clinical care, the enactment of the privacy and security rules has caused major changes in the way physicians and medical centers operate. The complex legalities and potentially stiff penalties associated with HIPAA, as well as the increase in paperwork and the cost of its implementation, were causes for concern among physicians and medical centers. An August 2006 article in the journal Annals of Internal Medicine detailed some such concerns over the implementation and effects of HIPAA, effects on research, HIPAA restrictions on researchers have affected their ability to perform retrospective, chart-based research as well as their ability to prospectively evaluate patients by contacting them for follow-up. A study from the University of Michigan demonstrated that implementation of the HIPAA privacy rule resulted in a drop from 96% to 34% in the proportion of follow-up surveys completed by study patients being followed after a heart attack. Another study, detailing the effects of HIPAA on recruitment for a study on cancer prevention, demonstrated that HIPAA-mandated changes led to a 73% decrease in patient accrual a tripling of time spent recruiting patients, and a tripling of mean recruitment costs. In addition, informed consent forms for research studies now are required to include extensive detail on how the participants' protected health information will be kept private. While such information is important, the addition of a lengthy, legalistic section on privacy may make these already complex documents even less user-friendly for patients who are asked to read and sign them. These data suggest that the HIPAA privacy rule, as currently implemented, may be having negative impacts on the cost and quality of medical research. Dr. Kim Eagle, professor of internal medicine at the University of Michigan, was quoted in the Annals article as saying, Privacy is important, but research is also important for improving care. We hope that we will figure this out and do it right. Effects on clinical care the complexity of HIPAA, combined with potentially stiff penalties for violators, can lead physicians and medical centers to withhold information from those who may have a right to it. A review of the implementation of the HIPAA privacy rule by the U.S. Government Accountability Office found that healthcare providers were uncertain about their legal privacy responsibilities and often responded with an overly guarded approach to disclosing information than necessary to ensure compliance with the privacy rule. Reports of this uncertainty continue. Costs of implementation, in the period immediately prior to the enactment of the HIPAA Privacy and Security Acts, medical centers and medical practices were charged with getting into compliance. With an early emphasis on the potentially severe penalties associated with violation, many practices and centers turned to private for-profit HIPAA consultants, who were intimately familiar with the details of the legislation and offered their services to ensure that physicians and medical centers were fully in compliance. In addition to the costs of developing and revamping systems and practices, the increase in paperwork and staff time necessary to meet the legal requirements of HIPAA may impact the finances of medical centers and practices at a time when insurance companies and Medicare reimbursement is also declining. Education and training Education and training of healthcare providers is paramount to correct implementation of the HIPAA Privacy and Security Acts. Effective training must describe the statutory and regulatory background and purpose of HIPAA and a general summary of the principles and key provisions of the privacy rule. Explain and define the type of entities that are covered by the privacy rule. The term business associate is defined as are the requirements of the privacy rule when they carry out healthcare activities and functions on behalf of covered entities. Describes privacy rule provisions that address how entity organization may affect privacy functions. Describes the health information that is protected by the privacy rule. The presentation extensively describes the required and permitted uses and disclosures of FI by a covered entity or its business associate including situations where FI may be used or disclosed without the individual a Euro unregistered trademark s authorization and when such authorization is required. 
the rule a euro unregistered trademark s minimum necessary provisions and its requirements are explained summarizes the privacy rule a euro unregistered trademark s provisions and requirements related to research describes when a covered entity may use and disclose FI for research purposes and what research is affected. The presentation illustrates the relationship of the privacy rule EU Euro unregistered trademark S research provisions to other research rules, such as the common rule. Describes the privacy rule EU Euro unregistered trademark S administrative requirements for covered entities, such as policies and procedures, data safeguards, documentation and record retention, Prohibition on retaliation, complaints to the covered entity, workforce training and sanctions. HIPAA and drug and alcohol rehabilitation organizations, special considerations for confidentiality are needed for healthcare organizations that offer federally funded drug or alcohol rehabilitation services. Predating HIPAA by over a quarter century are the Comprehensive Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism Prevention, Treatment and Rehabilitation Act of 1970 and language amended by the Drug Abuse Office and Treatment Act of 1972. Violations of HIPAA According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, between April 2003 and January 2013 they received 91,000 complaints of HIPAA violations, in which 22,000 led to enforcement actions of varying kinds and 521 led to referrals to the U.S. Department of Justice. Examples of significant breaches of protected information and other HIPAA violations include, the largest loss of data that affected 4.9 million people by Tricare Management of Virginia in 2011, the largest fines of $4.3 million levied against Signet Health of Maryland in 2010 for ignoring patients' requests to obtain copies of their own records and repeated ignoring of federal officials' inquiries, the first criminal indictment was lodged in 2011 against a Virginia physician who shared information with a patient's employer under the false pretenses that the patient was a serious and imminent threat to the safety of the public, when in fact he knew that the patient was not such a threat. The differences between civil and criminal penalties are summarized in the following table, Title III, Tax-Related Health Provisions Governing Medical Savings Accounts, Title III standardizes the amount that may be saved per person in a pre-tax medical savings account. Beginning in 1997, medical savings accounts are available to employees covered under an employer-sponsored high-deductible plan of a small employer and self-employed individuals. Title IV, Application and Enforcement of Group Health Insurance Requirements Title IV specifies conditions for group health plans regarding coverage of persons with pre-existing conditions, and modifies continuation of coverage requirements. It also clarifies continuation coverage requirements and includes COBRA clarification. Title V, Revenue Offset Governing Tax Deductions for Employers. Title V includes provisions related to company-owned life insurance for employers providing company-owned life insurance premiums prohibiting the tax deduction of interest on life insurance loans, company endowments, or contracts related to the company. It also repeals the financial institution rule to interest allocation rules. Finally, it amends provisions of law relating to people who give up United States citizenship or permanent residence, expanding the expatriation tax to be assessed against those deemed to be giving up their U.S. status for tax reasons and making ex-citizens' names part of the public record through the creation of the quarterly publication of individuals who have chosen to expatriate. Legislative Information, Pub Bell. 104 a Euro 191, 110 a Stat A 1936, H.R. 3103. H. Rept 104 to 469, Part 1. H. Rept 104 to 736, S 1028. S 1698. S Rept 104 to 156, HHS Security Standards, 45 CFR. 160, 162, and 164, HHS Standards for Privacy of Individually Identifiable Health Information, 45 CFR. 160 and 164, References. External links
California Office of HIPAA Implementation, HIPAA, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Congressional Research Service Reports Regarding HIPAA, University of North Texas Libraries, Full Text of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act U.S. Government Printing Office, Full Text of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act Legal Archiver, Office for Civil Rights Page on HIPAA.